everyone. Welcome to this uh, session on uh, emissions in electricity. My name is uh, Guido Pepermans, and I will be chairing this session. Uh, actually, my role will only be time uh, management. Um, so we have four speakers. Um, we are already five minutes uh, late, uh, meaning that we have 25 minutes left per speaker. So all uh, presentations will have uh, 20 minutes uh, of time, and we will then have uh, five additional minutes of, of, uh, of discussion, questions, and, and, and answers. Uh, people from the audience that would like to uh, ask a question, I would uh, either urge them to, to use the chat to, uh, to put it over there and uh, keep their question uh, until the end of the presentation. Uh, and uh, you can also use your microphone then at that time to, to ask your question. So the first presentation that we have today is a presentation by Filippo Beltrami, Beltram, if I'm correct, uh, on uh, the zonal and seasonal CO2 marginal emission factors for the Italian uh, power market. So uh, Filippo, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Guido, for the introduction. Let me share the screen with you. I assume now you can see my presentation. Yes, we can. Perfect. So I'm very pleased to open this session on emissions on electricity markets. And uh, it's the first time for me at uh, this conference, so I'm very happy to uh, enjoy it. And uh, in this presentation, I'm going to give you a talk on the study we performed uh, together with my co-authors, Fulvio Fontini, Monica Giulietti, and Luigi Grossi, on the identification of the CO2 margin emission factors for a market which is characterized by a relatively high penetration of renewables. It provides sufficient uh, research opportunities because there are, there's a lot of heterogeneity. It is a zonal uh, market characterized often by congestion as well. And uh, it has a very high level of data transparency. So this is the outline of the presentation of today. Starting from the introduction, uh, I present the methodology that we used for this novel calculation of margin emission factors for the Italian market, and then brief, briefly describe the data and present the main results and some final policy recommendations. So policy is for sure the main driver of uh, this work. Uh, as we all know, the penetration of renewable energy sources within electricity markets convey a twofold benefit an economic one in terms of higher variable quantities and lower average wholesale electricity prices, but also, uh, and more importantly, um, an environmental one because re uh, renewables crowd out the carbon intensive thermoelectric generation and therefore allow to uh, obtain an, uh, an environmental benefit in terms of carbon reduction. But how do we estimate a relationship between the production of electricity within an electricity grid and the total amount of carbon emissions. What is usually in place is the use of average emission factors, which for sure are not reliable tools to inform policy interventions because they totally ignore the variability of electricity production, the dynamic change of the merit order uh, structure uh, for the creation of the supply and the intersection of the demand curve for the exchange of electricity. And more importantly, the uh, carbon intensity of the marginal units of production that are called to clear the market. And crucially, the marginal units are the first that potentially are exposed to pot uh, marginal policy interventions that try to stimulate the production from renewables, for instance. Therefore, what we need to focus, and it is the object of the paper, is the study of marginal emission factors. So the average carbon content of marginal units of production. So this is the structure of the Italian wholesale power market, as it was in 2018, which is the um, time period of uh, investigation for this analysis. There, are six, there were six physical market zones, the light blue one, and uh, they, we have the interconnections with the uh, neighboring uh, countries. Plus, there were some limited production poles 
uh, in place that were uh, only producing electricity without uh, the consumption. Now they have been incorporated in the southern uh, zone since the 1st of January 2021. So there's a high level of heterogeneity within the uh, Italian electricity market. And uh, beyond this, uh, we uh, contribute to the literature on margin emission factors by uh, using an intraday approach. So by taking our time series variables in a subsequent way, and this allows to capture uh, uh, the shocks from the economic and social activity. And uh, these regional differences, and this is the main takeaway message of this paper, must be exploited for policy purposes. But most importantly, in this paper, we introduce uh, the calculation of the math with the, a fractionally co-integrated vector autoregressive model, which extends the classic idea of Engel and Granger and Johansson, and uh, allows to capture the time series properties uh, for high frequency data because the Italian power market works on a hourly basis. How does the literature usually study margin emission factors? So the literature dates back to the US literature where carbon emissions were regressed against uh, electricity generation with the inclusion of some fixed effects. But the variables were kept in levels. And what hoax claimed uh, with his papers on short run and long run margin emission factor for the UK power system was that these two time series variables needed to be taken in first differences because they contained a unit book. However, in a recent paper that we um, published, um, we study these time series variables across the UK and the Italian market and we claim that our time series variables may be actually integrated of an order which is lower than one. It can range between zero and one. And so the RFIM approach was uh, found to be more efficient. But uh, so as I was mentioning before, I take, we are, take the intraday perspective in this case. So we take the concatenation of hours, which is relevant, especially for uh, power plants that are characterized by technical constraints and work on an intertemporal basis, such as storage power plants. However, the use of an intraday approach, which takes our time series variables in a um, subsequent way, uh, of course, uh, is more computationally demanding. So, uh, a complex uh, econometric framework need to be, needs to be uh, adopted. So in this paper, three elements are the most important one for our calculation of margin emission factors. We take the zonal institutional market setting. We include the generation from renewables in uh, the electricity uh, generation variable. And we use this flexible econometric approach that we need to um, test in, uh, uh, in order to find the correct model to uh, try to uh, study the relationship between our two variables. So what we assume and we test empirically is that we should use a fractionally co-integrated VAR where the co-movement of the two variables that we try to establish as an equilibrium relationship might be actually a partial co-movement throughout the sample period and not a complete one. So in this way, we need to test the, um, the validity of this assumption in the data. And this is the most important slide of this presentation. This is the representation of the FC VAR model, where we estimate our coefficients uh, through maximum likelihood on seasonally adjusted data. Here, uh, D is the uh, order of integration, the fractional ordinary integration of the single time series variables, whereas B is the degree of fractional co-integration that guarantees a combination between our two variables to reach an equilibrium relationship which can be based on a, on a parameter b which can be also lower than one and the most important parameter of course is beta which expresses our estimate of the margin emission factor and we repeat this methodology for uh, each market uh, zone of course, we perform 
some robustness checks to check whether it is statistically correct to adopt an FC var rather than a simple a standard uh, classic VAR. But in case we do not find evidence with the rank cointegration test of any fractional or uh, cointegrating relationship, we simply go for the RFEMA or approach or the um, fixed effects OLS model. But as we see, uh, the FCVAR is adopted, especially for the full year sample analysis. And also we perform some other tests on the other coefficients, alpha and uh, beta. So this is the description of the data we use for this analysis. We focus on the Italian day ahead for sale power market which represents nearly 80% of the final scheduling of production of uh, power plants in Italy. Uh, we exclude from the analysis the zone south because in 2018 in Italy, it was um, the data for the polluting generators that were physically located in the south uh, were kept apart in the limited production poles that I was mentioning before. So we do not have uh, data about emissions for South and we focus the analysis on the other five market zones. By the way, I should mention that North is the most representative uh, one in Italy. So the uh, first variable electricity generation is derived from the analysis of the bit stops in the day ahead power market. We codify also the type of uh, the um, uh, power plants and their installed capacity. But most importantly, uh, the uh, calculation of carbon emissions uh, starts from the data on actual efficiency thermoelectric power plants, because we, what we do is to model uh, the hourly amount of fuel, uh, natural gas, oil, or coal that they consume um, at the plant level. So we were, let me just show you in this slide how we compute uh, plant level carbon emissions. This is uh, an engineering model which was uh, provided by an energy consulting company, RFE. And this allows, based on some plant level efficiency coefficients, to model, to extrapolate the hourly amount of fuel consumption at the plant level based on the type of fuel used by the uh, thermoelectric power plant. Then we interact the uh, consumption of fuel with the co simple uh, conversion factor, a constant one, and we uh, derive the final amount of emission from national carbon intensities from local fuel combustion, which only depend on the type of fuel. And for them, we take them from the uh, database of the Italian National Institute for Environmental Protection. And in this case, the CO2 intensities for renewables are assumed for sake of simplicity to, and uh, for uh, actual uh, evidence to be zero, because we are only focusing on direct emissions. So, um, okay, the calculation was uh, performed with the statistical software uh, R and uh, for the FCVAR, we use an algorithm uh, in MATLAB. So just to give you an idea about the heterogeneity of the power generation mix in Italy, um, this was for data uh, about 2018. Uh, hydro plays an important part in, uh, in the north, uh, whereas in center north, in Tuscany, we have uh, nearly 33% of production from geothermal. And as far as we go to the southern regions, we find more uh, presence of wind, large wind uh, uh, farms, especially in the south and in Sicily. And as you can see also here in Sardinia, the black part of thermoelectric generation is still relevant. As a matter of fact, in Sardinia, there are still some inefficient and uh, polluting generators that uh, tells uh, a lot about the story of the margin emission factors that we present in the final results uh, in the presentation. This is the visual representation of uh, uh, hourly generation and hourly emissions for the physical zone north. And the first symptom of fractional cointegration 
is that there is a kind of co-movement between our two uh, time series variables that uh, is not complete throughout the sample period we analyze. So this is the first idea behind the fractional co-integration, which needs to be tested, of course. So we now go uh, and explore the results. And we conduct the preliminary usual uh, unit root and stationary test. And uh, for the full year analysis, we confirm that our time series variables indicate fractional integration at the individual level. So data exhibit long memory. At the quarterly level, this is also true, but for uh, Sardinia. Also in this case, data seem to point towards fractional co-integration. So after this unit root and stationary test, we perform the rank uh, co-integration test. And we find that indeed in, uh, at the full year, the FC VAR is appropriate for all zones, except for center south, where there is no evidence of a fractional co-integration relationship. And we use the RFIM approach in this case. Uh, on the opposite side, at uh, the quarterly level, uh, the FC VAR is rejected, and also the classic uh, VAR uh, is uh, inappropriate. So we use the RFIMA in most of uh, the cases with the variables in levels. And this is a preview in qualitative terms of the final uh, results that we see in the next two slides. So this is the summary of results at the full year sample, 2018. I report here both the computation of the math and the average emission factor as a term of uh, comparison. How do we uh, read these results? Well, basically, the margin emission factor uh, expresses the average carbon intensity of the marginal generators that usually clear the market. So they set the equilibrium uh, price. This is the, the idea behind the merit order and the marginal cost uh, ranking of the supply. So um, another interpretation of the margin emission factor is that uh, that is also the uh, carbon intensity of the marginal generators and the, they are also, uh, they express the potential for carbon offsets in case some policy intervention wants to act, act on the marginal uh, structure of electricity production in an uh, analyzed region. And what the, the literature usually highlights is that the margin emission factor is more correct and uh, um, to estimate the carbon offsets and to uh, provide a reliable tool for policy making because the average emission factor underestimates the potentials for carbon offsets because they do not include all the factors that we mentioned before that are crucial in this case. And as I highlighted here, this is true for all zones that the average emission factor underestimates the potential for carbon offsets, except for the north. And this was quite a striking result at first. What we claim, the, how do we interpret the result? And this was also true for a study applied to the Belgian case in year 2000, where there were less renewables compared to uh, the current times. We claim that the uh, MEF is lower than the IF because there's a sufficient, sufficiently high level of integration between renewables and hydroelectric pumped storage power plants that are um, widely distributed in the northern area of Italy because of the Alps and the geographic uh, con configuration of this area. So the installed uh, type of power plants explain the results of uh, the margin emission factors. We also provide the analysis at the quarterly level uh, with the same methodology we used so far. And we uh, find that in the first quarter of the year, so from January to March, there's a high carbon intensity in all zones, except for Sicily, which displays a low, uh, higher margin emission factor in the other quarters during summer periods. But this result is uh, mainly due to the uh, configuration of the uh, market zone Sicily and the frequent 
occurrences of congestions between Sicily and the, and the southern zone. Another relevant aspect, and which is quite alarming in uh, our perspective, is the result for Sardinia, which confirms that to have the highest margin emission factor in Italy. Therefore, uh, some uh, um, considerations about the phasing out of coal inefficient thermoelectric power plants in this area need to be uh, further uh, examined. So let me draw the, uh, wrap up the final conclusions of this analysis. We said and we report that average emission factor wrongly assess the potentials for carbon offsets and that margin emission factor produce reliable evaluation of policy, policy measures because uh, subsidies to REST may be actually um, more targeted and depending on the margin emission factor, which uh, in turn depends on the region uh, which is analyzed. And this is true not only for the Italian electricity market, but can be applied uh, in broader terms. So zonal margin emission factors are relevant for targeted energy environmental policy making. And these regional differences are crucial for when the generation mix varies geographically and uh, the marginal structure uh, of uh, uh, the electricity market varies uh, accordingly. That is all from my side. And thank you all for your attention and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Filippo. Uh, I did not uh, give you a warning because you were perfectly on time. Uh, was, oh, great. Uh, I think so. I didn't uh, realize it at all. <laughs> okay, uh, are there any questions uh, from the audience? Uh, I don't see uh, questions uh, popping up in the chat already, but maybe there are uh, people in the audience that want to use a microphone with a question. Christian is raising his hand. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, Christian. Yes, I have a couple of questions. But first of all, uh, thank you, Filippo, for uh, doing this work on and for this uh, great presentation. It's always nice to see uh, other researchers focusing on these kind of topics because they are quite important. We we need more renewables in our markets, but we need to understand what they do over there and how they are impacting these markets. And each angle that we analyze brings us closer to understanding how we can integrate more of them and uh, if it's useful and if it's working as we think they should work. So uh, it's quite interesting to, to see the Italian market because I'm not fully familiar with it. And I would like to start just with a very brief uh, generic question on uh, the power mix. I saw there's not much solar in there or I understood wrongly. And if it's so, why is the case? Because for me, Italy is quite sunny, so it's a bit striking to not have a lot of sun, uh, solar power uh, in there. Yeah, thank you for, for the question, Christian. Indeed, there are uh, there is a lot of installation of PV, uh, photovoltaic power plants, both mm -hmm. large and small scale ones. What we did in our codification process was also to distinguish between the large uh, installation of power plants, of PV power plants, plants which are more relevant uh, in, uh, in uh, southern regions, whereas in the north we have a lot of small scale installations of uh, PV power plants that we include in a, a generic uh, category which we call non-relevant uh, renewable energy okay. sources, which include all the small uh, power plants with uh, installed power capacity lower than 10 megawatts. And these uh, plants do not bid autonomously on the, on the electricity market, but they are collected in a unique uh, category depending on the uh, geographic, uh, uh, so on the location, basically, mm -hmm. from, from the Italian market operator. And their bids are placed all together at the zero price in the, in the market. And indeed, what we uh, calculated in another paper, which comes out of uh, my PhD uh, project of research, is that uh, solar is indeed very relevant to abut carbon emissions. So to uh, save carbon emissions to the environment, because they have an important role in crowding out uh, the thermoelectric exactly. generation. But in the North, uh, we find that um, because of the flexibility and the predictability with, uh, with which you can use storage 
pumped hydro storage in the north. That may be the main reason uh, for the lower calculation of the MEF for the north as respect to the average uh, aggregate average emission factor for that area. But this is the main explanation for the, yeah, we codified uh, the solar power plants and they are quite relevant. Now, now, now it's clearer to me. And, and I also saw that the results seem to vary a lot by the power mix that, uh, that exists in the area. Uh, well, the, the other part of the power mix, excluding the, the renewables, and the more polluting they are, it seems that the higher the value of integrating renewables because you are taking them out of, uh, of uh, the merit order curve. And that's, that's something that we would expect, and it's good to see that it's happening. What would be interesting to see, but I'm not sure if it's possible to see from what you did. Um, in the market uh, where I'm based in the Netherlands, mm, there's still, uh, uh, well, there are some renewables, but not, not um, predominantly, uh, not, not the main source of uh, energy of power uh, in uh, this region. And we saw um, through a just small study that we did that so far we don't see a big decrease in the CO2 uh, emissions uh, over here uh, due to uh, installation of renewables. And that was because when you had more wind or more sun, some coal or gas power plants had to ramp up production. And in this way, uh, they were emitting much more in these hours. So I'm not sure if it's similar for uh, Italy to a certain extent. Okay, we reduce the total output of, let's say, coal uh, power plants, but they pollute per megawatt produced more because they have to ramp up and ramp down uh, a lot. And I'm not sure if you, you can see something in, in your research based on that. Yeah, it is, it is in can my... You, sorry, can you keep oh, it uh, short, the answer, because we are running out of time. Okay, so, sure, sure. Uh, just um, 30 seconds. So you know, yeah, I agree that they depend on the uh, the mix, the composition mix, and the structure of the marginal generators, and uh, also the installed capacity, depending on the day and depend on the hours. So I will distinguish between off peak and peak hours to go for this uh, research for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, if if Filippo wants another question, I can give from my time because I stole from his time uh, with my long uh, question. Okay. So if someone else wants to ask a question, no problem. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you for the questions, Christian. Uh, so we're uh, uh, we will be moving now to the the second uh, paper uh, that will be presented by Christian Stett uh, on varying impact of intermittent supply on hourly day ahead electricity prices. Uh, Christian, uh, you have the floor. Christian, you're muted. Yep. Okay. Yes, now no, it's all good. Thank you. Thank you, Filippo. Um, so my presentation uh, uh, is not necessarily directed, uh, directly linked to uh, CO2 emissions, but indirectly through the fact that we are analyzing renewables and how they impact power prices. Uh, there, there is a link in there, but I'm not sure if it's the, the ideal session to, to present it, but I hope you'll find it uh, interesting, even if it's not uh, uh, the main focus of, of this session. So what we are doing, we are analyzing power prices and uh, the impact that renewables uh, have on these power prices. Uh, when uh, we talk about power prices, we talk about this type of prices. And here you have an example from Germany and we are looking at day ahead power prices, uh, meaning blocks of hourly blocks for delivery in the next day. I'm sure you're familiar with this kind of graphs where you see lots of extreme prices, lots of mirror reversion. And we already know from the literature quite some things about uh, how renewables are impacting these prices. We know that the more renewables we have, the lower the, the power prices because they have a close to zero marginal cost or as I like to uh, think about them sometimes even negative marginal costs because they have subsidies many times attached to them these renewables and then they're profitable even when they're bidding on negative prices um, in a recent paper we did we also show that the more renewables the more extreme low prices we observe in markets and uh, the less extreme high prices 
However, we, we don't know that much yet about uh, how these prices are impacting, how these renewables are impacting prices at each moment in time. Is it a constant uh, effect or it varies uh, in, and in certain moments in time is more pronounced and in other ones less? So this is what we try to analyze. And we just by looking, for example, at uh, uh, what happened last year in the middle of the first uh, COVID uh, case, we suddenly found ourselves in uh, an environment with uh, a much higher share of renewables because the, the power markets were running uh, at the capacity of, uh, or at, or at the demand of around, I don't know, 80% of a normal demand. The, the weather was still good, so you had lots of wind, lots of solar, and we suddenly saw lots of extreme low prices. Um, that was something as expected, uh, uh, considering what we are doing over here. Um, but we need more clarity. We need to understand how uh, renewables are affecting prices in, in specific moments in time. Um, the main research question and the question that we try to solve through with this uh, paper is, well, is, is uh, the impact from renewables on uh, their health power prices the same uh, when extreme prices occur or compared to the ones uh, when moderate prices occur? And we are expecting that when prices are already very low or very high, a change in uh, the share of renewables to, to impact much more uh, the power prices uh, than when the prices are already moderate. And that makes sense if you think about the merit order curve and the, the way the prices are set in, uh, in power markets. Because when the prices are moderate, it means you have a kind of moderate demand. And there's lots of producers that can easily ramp up or ramp down uh, production at uh, marginal cost, just a bit higher or lower. While when you're in the extreme situations, uh, if, uh, for example, prices are already very high, uh, a change in renewables might affect much more uh, the, the power prices over there because there's scarcity in competition and the same when the prices are already very low. So how, how do we analyze this question? We, we are looking at a quantum regression model and this kind of technique, uh, it's very helpful uh, because it allows you to introduce fundamental factors and you can isolate moments with specific characteristics, moments that uh, you are interested in and you can uh, tackle them and look at them in isolation. And this technique it seems to be already used by uh, quite a lot of people in uh, power markets and also specifically for uh, renewable uh, supply impact on power prices was used uh, by Hackford, uh, Savio and uh, Maciejowska. Maciejowska. Um, and it seems to work and it seems to be easy to, to implement uh, this kind of research question on it. What we do more compared to, to other, uh, other studies is we, we are considering uh, the aspect that they had power prices are actually a panel uh, type of uh, data set. And because of this, um, what other papers did using just simple quantum regression, they use average daily prices, off-peak prices or peak prices, or you just take one sequence of one uh, hour block and you follow it through a uh, time series uh, aspect. Um, but we think doing like this, uh, you lose a lot of information, you lose a lot of uh, data through, through average. And we, we really wanted to work on finding a way to organize this quantum regression in a panel setting. And uh, this is helpful because it allows us to analyze all the 24 hours in the same uh, analysis, in the same regression. Um, uh, and for, uh, let's say, managers later on, if they want to apply this methodology to, let's say, forecast power prices, they can do it for each hour of the, of the next day and not just on averages, not uh, just for a specific hour, uh, hour in time. And to my knowledge, this is the first study that, uh, that looks at, uh, at uh, this matter from this point of view and using the whole uh, all hours. And just to give you a bit more detail about why it's important to look at uh, this data in a panel uh, setting is, well, here you have from Germany the hourly prices for uh, 1st of July last year. And 
well, there are 24 blocks of uh, prices, but all these prices are set at the same moment in time. They are set one day before here, for example, it's the 30th of uh, June 2020 in the morning. Uh, so they all rely on the same information. It's not a, a gradual uh, building of information throughout the day like you have in other markets, let's say in the stock markets, where uh, each with each hour, with each minute, a uh, new information comes into place and then uh, reflects into the prices. Well, here, uh, all these prices are set in the in the same moment in time. And in the same uh, way, another uh, uh, important aspect is that uh, adjacent hours are, are uh, very correlated because this uh, um, this fact that we have hourly blocks is just a, a convenience way of uh, setting the market that we humans decided is not something that exists in physics. Uh, in, uh, uh, electricity and electrons, when they're flowing uh, into the grid, they don't care about the blocks of hours. So uh, it is a continuation in a way, but uh, we, we just set it up uh, like that as a, as a conventional way of uh, deciding uh, the electricity markets. So how do, do we analyze? Uh, we, we create uh, this model uh, which uh, in which we are interested mostly about uh, the VRE, meaning Variable uh, Renewable uh, Energy. Um, we're interesting about the coefficient delta over there, and we are expecting it to be negative and to be to be significantly more negative for uh, the extreme quanta, so the very low prices and the very high prices. To control uh, better for our model, we also had to include uh, demand levels, which uh, obviously impact uh, significantly prices and also the uh, a proxy for the marginal uh, cost and. The, there are various ways of doing it. Uh, either you take like uh, uh, all the, the the cost of an underlying assets of the conventional supplier, let's say gas price, coal price, or whatever exists in your power mix, or you can uh, look at some lagged uh, version of prices because uh, on average they will lead to the to the marginal uh, cost of the underlying uh, fuels, and this is what we do in uh, in our uh, research. Um, we test this this model on the uh, German data. So we have uh, uh, they had hourly prices. You can see over there. You, I already showed it briefly to you in the beginning of the presentation. Um, the estimated uh, marginal costs. Uh, you can see that also varies, and in some moments in time it can be very high, and some others is uh, low. And we have demand uh, and uh, share of renewables. Uh, the share of renewables, even if it grows over time, it's uh, you can still find moments with the high uh, share of renewables in the first uh, part of the data set and also in the last part, you can find the moments with a low share of uh, renewables. So if we would do the same research just for one of the years that we analyze or uh, uh, selecting randomly uh, some data points, you would uh, arrive to the same uh, conclusion, to the same results. Before doing these uh, regressions, I, I want to point out again that uh, the hours are very correlated close to the uh, close to that the adjacent hours are very closely correlated. So let's say prices at hour 11 in the morning uh, have a correlation of uh, 0.94 to the hour uh, 10, and, and that makes sense because the, the power market uh, uh, change changes gradually from one hour to another. And when we analyze this, we have to find a way to decorrelate uh, uh, these residuals so when, uh, and before running the actual regression. And this is what we do in our uh, model and which allows us to run uh, the, the setup as a, as a panel uh, regression. I will not go into details about uh, this uh, considering the time limitation, but through the methodology that we use, uh, we are able to uh, make a to kind of decorrelate, if you can say that, the, the errors and be able to analyze uh, analyze well the, the results. So um, just a brief uh, selection of the, the main result that we, we look at. Uh, uh, in this table, uh, the delta Q is the impact that uh, renewables have on power prices. and. You can see that at the 50th quantile, so medium prices, when prices are moderate, uh, an increase in the share of renewables 
will uh, decrease the price by um, 0 0.56 euro. It doesn't seem a lot, but let's say the increase would be 10%, it would be already like 5.6 uh, euro decrease. Well, well, this uh, it's a significantly uh, uh, a significant decrease, and uh, it's uh, significantly below zero. Uh, we can see that uh, when we get to the extremes, to the very low prices or very high prices of the first, second, third quantile, or 97, 98, 99, uh, this uh, impact of uh, renewables it, it increases and is significantly higher. So, as expected. When prices are already extreme, the, uh, the impact from a change in renewables uh, will, will be greater than when prices are, are moderate. And if we'll do the picture for all uh, 99 quantiles uh, analyzed, uh, it will look like this. And you can see that in the middle of the distribution uh, of uh, power prices, you have uh, still a, a negative impact of renewables on power prices, but not as, uh, uh, deep or not as big as when, uh, when the prices uh, are, are extreme. And bef uh, we, we could have just concluded a paper looking at this uh, aspect in detail, but we are thinking, well, renewables are reducing their health prices, and then we also have demand that increases their health prices. However, uh, a part of demand is supplied by renewables, so there must be some interaction between uh, these two variables that we we should account for, we should take into consideration. And from what we saw in the literature, no one uh, did it uh, yet, or no one really looked into detail in, uh, into this. And uh, we wanted to also test for that. And we, we introduced an uh, additional uh, um, hypothesis in which we are, we are looking if uh, adding a, a, such an element and the interaction between the demand and the share of renewables, uh, can improve the explanation, uh, the explanatory uh, value of uh, of the model. And how do we do it? Well, we add this interaction factor, which is just uh, a multiplication uh, uh, between demand and the share of uh, of renewables. And when we do that, we obtain this kind of figure, which uh, becomes three D and well, uh, the shape is the same, it's just three-dimensional, and you will get more granularity, more more detail about uh, what what uh, uh, how renewables are impacting uh, power prices. And we obtained this uh, result by just looking at the first order derivative of uh, of the estimated model that I just showed you in the in the previous slide. Um, even if the picture looks nice, it's, it's harder just by looking at it to say, well, is it better to use it like that or like uh, just a simple model that we had uh, we had before. And to compare this, we uh, use the AIC comparison uh, and we, we can see uh, from these two uh, tables that, uh, well, the dashed line is the model with interaction and the uh, solid line uh, represents the uh, IAC for uh, the model uh, without the interaction factor. And the lower it is, the, the, the better the, the model. And we can see that by adding this uh, interaction between demand and uh, share of uh, renewables, um, we, we can improve the explanatory power of, of the model. So what we learn from, uh, from this study on the general market is that, uh, well, renewables are decreasing power prices, but they are not decreasing them at a constant uh, level. In some moments they're decreasing it faster, and some other moments less fast, depending on how uh, flexible or inflexibility constrained the, the market is at a specific moment uh, in times. And we also saw that for the German market, at least, um, including a factor between, uh, of interaction between the demand and share of supply, uh, from renewables uh, can can increase performance of uh, this type of, uh, of models. However, we we want to challenge ourselves and say, well, you know, this is for Germany, but will will it hold also for for Spain? And we do a small case study on, on Spain too. We have the same type of data set. However, we have to point out that you see the prices just by looking at them, they are not the same type of prices. And this is because there is a limitation in Spain for not having negative uh, prices so already uh, you cannot observe extreme low uh, uh, power prices because below zero is not possible and the spanish power market is much more flexible especially on the 
moment when uh, you have lots of demand and you you would see typically on the German power market uh, a lot of extremes, extreme high prices. Well, on the Spanish one, you don't see that much because there's lots of backup capacity uh, that can flexibly ramp up when when needed. So we would expect the same kind of results, but not as pronounced as for for Germany. And this is exactly what we will. Sir, we see that on average uh, renewables are reducing by 0.54 uh, euro per megawatt uh, with each increase of uh, 1% a share uh, in the power mix. And when you go to, towards the extremes, uh, it decreases much more, but not as much as uh, in, the, in the German power market. And the picture uh, compared to the one on uh, the Germany looks, looks like this. Uh, we, we still uh, have the same type of pattern, but is uh, not as pronounced uh, on the edges as on the German power market. Now, what is interesting, I didn't, I don't want to go too much into it on the second model, but on the Spanish model, we see that if you add the interaction factor between demand and um, a share of renewables, the model performs actually worse. And we are thinking, why is that the case? And it makes sense in a way, because uh, over there in Spain, since uh, you have much more flexible supply that can easily uh, ramp up or ramp uh, down uh, uh, when, when it's needed to con counterbalance the, the supply from renewables or the, off, or the lack of it. Um, this interaction between uh, supply, uh, between demand and supply from renewables doesn't matter that much because uh, it's easily counterbalanced by the other uh, parts of the supply mix. While in Germany, uh, if, if some, at some moments, for example, there's just inflexible supply running and they have to ramp down, it's very hard for them to do it. Or if uh, uh, the prices are already very high and there are not enough uh, a cheap producers to ramp further up uh, production, then you will observe these extreme uh, prices. So just to uh, give you the main takeaways, well, we see that um, renewables are not having a constant impact on uh, in lowering uh, their head power prices. In the highest and lowest quantiles, they have a, a much uh, steeper uh, price uh, decrease, uh, induce a much steeper price uh, uh, reduce. Um, that uh, this, uh, this impact of renewables is conditional on demand, but it depends a lot on the, the type of, uh, of uh, market uh, we are analyzing. If the market is more flexible, the, the interaction between demand and the share of renewables is less uh, important. And if it's uh, less uh, uh, flexible, it becomes more important. Um, why this study is important? Well, we, we go more in depth uh, into the literature on uh, how, how we can make use of quantum regressions to, to understand power markets and to understand the impact of renewables uh, on, uh, on power prices. And the model that we propose, as I briefly explained in the introduction of this presentation, provides, provides enhanced understanding of how our prices uh, behave. And this enhanced understanding can also lead to uh, improved price forecast. We don't do it in this uh, in this uh, research, but the methodology used can be further used for uh, forecasting prices, and uh, it, it can be very helpful for managers because you can easily uh, use this methodology to forecast for the next day for each hour more accurately at the same time without having to do separate analysis for each uh, hour in time. So considering that the time is up, I will just conclude here and I would like to thank you for uh, listening to my uh, presentation. And if you have any questions or comments now or after the presentation, just send me an email or let me know in a certain way and I'll be happy to, to have uh, to, uh, any, any uh, feedback that you can give. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh for uh, uh well christian for for actually taking over because actually i was tr uh, thrown out of the session i had some uh, ah. <laughs> connection issues you might not have noticed it but anyway uh, no everything was okay <laughs> no worries. Uh, so uh, i just returned uh, uh, when you were uh, finishing off your uh, your own discussion so okay thank you um let's start with the next paper then a uh, paper by fatima uh, nazifi on uh, emission intensities in the australian national electricity market uh, an econometric analysis
Okay. Thank you. I'll have to make you open for us. Thanks. So can you see my screen properly? Perfect. Yes, we so, can. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, uh, as you can see, uh, Australian electricity sector is currently undergoing a remarkable transition from uh, coal fire generation to higher share of renewable energy. And what we saw um, in Australia was a decrease in emission intensity, of course, a slight decrease. What was very interesting question to see uh, the reason behind this reduction or observed reduction in emission intensity. So in this paper, uh, Professor Stefan Truek and I uh, and his PhD student decided to investigate and quantify the factors impacting on evolution of uh, carbon dioxide emission of power sector in Australia. So, um, um, here, what we do is we using daily data from July 2009 to uh, end of December 2018 to analyze the evolution of um, uh, emission intensity uh, uh, within the name Australian National Electricity Market, which I give you more details about this market in a few minutes. According to the literature, the uh, literature there are factors impacting on emission intensity. The main factors uh, could be uh, changes in the generation of fossil fuel mix, electricity demand, quality of uh, fuel generation, and the uh, efficiency of the generation. But in Australia, there are other factors that could impact on this emission intensity, and this is why we uh, decided to study that one. It was about the withdrawal of major coal fire plant, more specifically in 2016 and 2017. In Australia, uh, more than 10 coal fire plants uh, removed from the market, um, and we wanted to study the impact on emission intensity. And of course, in Australia, uh, because Australia um, uh, signed the Paris Agreement on 10th of November 2016, so uh, they have uh, energy and climate policy in place to combat the climate change. And we wanted to uh, put particular emphasis to uh, do the assessment of any potential association between uh, the driving factor and major climate energy policies. In Australia, the major uh, climate and energy policies to uh, decrease the emission um, are carbon pricing mechanism, which already, uh, um, I mean, acts by uh, our new government. So it was just in place uh, between 2012 and 2014. That's why we um, investigate the impact of this policy on emission intensity and renewable energy target that this is the ongoing policy. And we believe that uh, this policy could impact um, on emission intensity significantly because resulted to a higher share of uh, renewable in generation mix. So that's why we take into consideration. Um, we use OLS regression and uh, other alternative models uh, to do the robustness check to quantify the factors driving emission intensity in uh, name and uh, in addition to the um, uh, national investigate this we uh, consider the major regional market within the name this is new south Wales, queensland south australia and victoria so as well as nationally we uh, study individually the driving factors for each state as well what we obtained is the changes in renewable deployments in Australia uh, can be considered as the principal factor affecting the emission intensity of the name. 
And um, after this factor, uh, we can see that the fossil fuel mixture effect, this is mainly uh, switch, uh, switching away from coal fired plants to gas fired plant uh, could impact significantly the emission intensity of power sector. As I mentioned, um, according to under the Paris Agreement, Australia needs to decrease the emission intensity uh, for the whole economy by 65%. And uh, if we consider the, the reason that we consider the emission intensity of the um, power sector is because in Australia, due to availability of very cheap coal, 35% uh, of emission comes from uh, power sector in Australia. And if we compare the emission intensity in Australia with other OECD countries, we see that uh, here we have very high emission per unit of GDP, about uh, 0 0.78. Uh, in comparison with uh, about 0.44 uh, European uh, countries. So it's very, very high and it's very, very important to reduce this emission in order to combat the uh, uh, climate change. Um, but uh, when we talk the, uh, about the emission intensity, we need to take into consideration that in Australia, in different states, we have different emission intensity. For example, Victoria, uh, which has a brown coal, uh, very dirty, um, um, I mean, coal or uh, quality of coal uh, in this state, has the highest emission intensity. And uh, of course, Tasmania, where we have the hydro and more than 95% of electricity comes from the hydro has the uh, lowest or um, yeah, lowest uh, emission intensity. So the average emission intensity of NEM in Australia um, is not uh, 0 0.9, but uh, in intensity is uh, very, uh, very significantly across the states. Victoria, the highest one, uh, South Australia and Tasmania, maybe the uh, can be considered as a lowest one. Okay, so this graph shows the national uh, electricity market in Australia. Uh, the national electricity market operates in the eastern states. So um, is uh, New South Wales, uh, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, and Victoria. And it operates as a mandatory wholesale pool under the management of the Australian energy market operator, EMO. In Australia, the wholesale market of the name is a real time. So it's not a, a day ahead uh, market. It's a real time market and set it at a 30 minute period. Um, limited amount of electricity also can be transferred across uh, these states. And we call it the interconnector. There is interconnectors between Queensland and New South Wales, New South Wales and Victoria, Victoria and South Australia. And in order to investigate the factors impacting on emission intensity, we take into consideration these interconnectors as well. Here, we see the emission intensity of power sector by states. As you can see, this uh, emission intensity uh, for mo uh, most of the states uh, experience a diminishing uh, trend, and uh, but not for Queensland, which I explain it in a few minutes, why not? Um, but uh, another thing that we can see from this graph is uh, quite substantial fluctuation of emission intensities on a day by day basis through time. Um, this because of the level of electricity demand, as well as the generation mix used for providing electricity on a specific time and a specific day. Okay, the reason that we see that this uh, diminishing in different states can be interpreted in different way. For example, in, in Victoria, the main reason that we see this diminishing return here uh, more specifically in 2016, and you see that here in 2017, is because of the uh, closure of coal-fired plants in these uh, states. 
and um, and uh, uh, switching away from coal to gas in this state because of a low uh, gas process for these estates. In South Australia, um, what we saw was uh, in 2017, the uh, closure of coal fire plants um, in the coal fire plant in this state, and now more than 50% of uh, uh, electricity in this state generated by wind, and the other, uh, the rest of the generation it is based on a gas fired plant. So uh, we do not have any coal uh, fired plant in this state anymore. And as you can see here, the, um, the reduction in South Australia can be considered as a biggest reduction. Here in New South Wales, we see that diminishing uh, uh, trend and the reason for that was again the closure of the coal fired plants in these states and, um, and uh, switching to uh, gas as well. In Queensland, what we saw is very, very um, strange. What we saw is uh, an increase in emission intensity in these states. And um, uh, the main reason is uh, because of the extracting coal steam in these states in order to extract that one, more specifically in 2016, 2017, and 2018, uh, they use more electricity to extract that one. And in order to uh, produce the, this electricity, they use coal-fired plants, and it could be considered as a main factor. Here in this table, uh, we see the emission intensity. This is the average emission intensity. Uh, we consider three uh, periods. Um, in Australia, as I mentioned, uh, the carbon tax uh, was in place uh, in 2000, between 2012 and 2014. And what we saw is for um, all states, uh, except the Queensland, uh, as a result of I don't know if it's the result, but what we saw is a decrease in emission um, intensity uh, during the carbon tax. But interestingly, when the carbon tax is uh, asked, what we saw is um, after uh, carbon tax is still in uh, some states such as Victoria, we see a reduction in emission intensity. In South Australia, a reduction in emission intensity, but in Queensland, as I mentioned, an increase in emission intensity. In New South Wales, um, slight uh, changes in emission intensity uh, in a period after the tax. And it's very really good to um, uh, explain why we saw these uh, changes in emission intensity and which factors could uh, explain that one. In Australia, um, we, uh, our government, um, have the renewable energy target, and through this target, they subsidize using the um, uh, wind and solar generation. So more than 90% of investment in uh, Australia, recent investment in renewable is through wind and solar generation. And we see the increased uh, share of this um, wind and solar generation in generation mix. So the contribution of renewable to electricity generation in the name has increased significantly. And mainly um, the reason for that can be because of the renewable um, energy target, which effectively, effectively effectively subsidizes their renewable sources. If I want to give you more uh, uh, detail about this one, at the same time that we see the investment, uh, an increase in investment in, in uh, the renewable um, sources, what we see is the closure of coal-fired plants in 2014, 2015, and 2016. And this gap uh, mainly uh, filled in by using sonar, solar and wind. Uh, as I mentioned, in uh, South Australia, uh, more than 50% of electricity comes from wind and uh, some in Victoria. So they play an important role to produce electricity in uh, uh, these estates. Here, um, it gives more uh, um, data for the investment in uh, generation. And uh, here is the uh, removal of the 
coal-fired plants in different states in Australia. In this study, as I mentioned, more than 11 uh, coal-fired plants removed uh, during our period uh, uh, investigated, but uh, for the purpose of this study, we just consider the um, uh, five uh, coal-fired plant. Uh, the reason for that is because by considering the capacity, they uh, impacted the market significantly. And uh, we just consider five, um, five of these uh, coal-fired plants. But- You have five minutes left. Oh, okay. Five minutes? Yes. <laughs> so uh, here in this um, graph, what I want to show you is despite these changes, coal fire generation remained the dominant supply technology in NEM, supplying more than 73% uh, of output in, uh, during our um, uh, period of the study. So um, the, by using that one, that's why we decided to see um, the factors that can explain these uh, changes. And uh, no study so far investigated the factor affecting the evolution of emission intensity of the power sector in Australia. So um, uh, the main contribution of this uh, paper is using the uh, high frequency data, daily data to investigate and we use the actual impact. Uh, we try to uh, quantify the impact of these factors on emission intensity. And uh, as I mentioned, we consider three different periods uh, before the carbon tax, during the carbon tax and after the carbon tax. This is the simple model that we use, OLS regression. Here we have emission intensity, the average emission intensity. Uh, literature shows the impact of demand on emission intensity. Um, and, um, but there are mixed results about that. Some uh, empirical studies show a positive relationship between demand and uh, emission intensity. Some shows uh, negative and some uh, study shows no relation. That's why we wanted to see what we can find here in Australia. They considered the share of uh, gas share of renewable and uh, dummy variable to uh, capture the impact of carbon tax on emission intensity. And of course, we take into consideration uh, the closure of coal fire plants by, taking, uh, by uh, defining these dummy variables. And uh, what we see here is the result. Uh, the, as you can see, what we found is a positive relationship between demand and emission intensity in Australia. And the main um, uh, reason behind that is because of the, uh, it seems that in Australia, the peak demand is met by uh, fossil fuel uh, generation. So that's why we see a positive relationship. As we expected, uh, an increase in uh, share of gas uh, and an increase in renewable sources are the main factors explaining the reduction in emission intensity in all states. Carbon tax has very, very limited impact on emission intensity in Australia. And maybe the reason behind that is because of uncertainty uh, associated with this policy and just was in place for two years. And um, uh, of course, generator not sure about the future of this policy and uh, didn't bother themselves to um, uh, do any investment to do the, uh, or switching from this to renewable. So that's why the limited impact. But of course the closure, as I mentioned, uh, significantly impacted the emission intensity, mainly the closure of the Hazelwood in Victoria with uh, 1,600 megawatts capacity uh, played an important role to reduce emission intensity in uh, Australia. We used, uh, in order to do a robustness check, we use a, a simultaneous um, equation and what we saw, sorry, this is the, that one, um, the result very, very similar to our base model. Another um, uh, robustness, uh, robustness check method that we use is using, instead of using the share of the uh, um, uh, coal or, or share of the gas, we use the amount of energy uh, to see what's the impact on emission intensity. And again, the result very similar to what we had for the uh, base model. 
So um, the conclusion, if I want to just to jump to a conclusion, an increasing share of renewable generation, generation an increasing share of gas in generation mix, and the closure of the coal fired plant can be considered as a, a main uh, or primary uh, factors explaining the decline in emission intensity. Uh, is very, very interesting what we saw uh, by using the coefficient that one percent increase in share of renewable could result in a reduction between 8 to 15 point kilogram to, uh, carbon dioxide per megawatt um, across the name and the same uh, for uh, gas fire generation. Um, for uh, policy implication, what we can see, of course, uh, environmental policies can be a significant driver, but they need a stable and long-term policy, which we uh, didn't have this kind of um, uh, certainty here in Australia. And of course, um, if we consider the future increase in the re uh, renewable generation asset, we expect a substantial, uh, substantial uh, decrease in emission intensity. So um, that's uh, my conclusion and thank you for uh, listening and sorry for uh, <laughs> over the limit talk. Okay, uh, thank you Fatima. Uh, are there any questions from, from the audience? I don't know, I have, the, I should check that one. Yeah, it's from me. Uh, uh -huh. it's, it's not a question, it's actually a comment. Uh -huh. um, when I, very interesting presentation, by the way, anyway, I don't know anything about the Australian uh, system, but uh, if you want to have a look, uh, the paper that I sent you on the chat is about long run margin emission factors for the uh, British system. And uh, it, deals with, it deals with basically the installation of a new type of capacity and uh, you can estimate uh, these emission intensities given the, some uh, assumptions on the installation and the phasing out of some types of technologies. So this might be linked to your topic. Thank so you. you Thank can you. have a look at that. No worries. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, thank you, guys. I mean, I have just a, a small question because I'm not very familiar with, with uh, these kinds of uh, econometric techniques, but I was wondering why, uh, at least if I understood correctly, because I was thrown out of the session uh, at some point once again, um, you did not use any time series techniques uh, whatsoever for, for your analysis. Um, is there any reason for that? I use time series techniques. I use OLS regression and two SLS regression. Okay, but uh, you don't correct for seasonal. Uh... Oh, because we take into consideration the demand, so that's why we didn't take into consideration the seasonality problem because we believe that demand could deal with that one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, then. Uh... I would suggest to move on to the last uh, paper, which will be presented by Atle Ogland uh, on carbon fuel sources and electricity prices in uh, European uh, 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 energy. Sorry, there is something uh, before my... Uh, 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 sorry, carbon fuels resources and electricity prices in Europe, why US energy markets policies matter. That's the correct title, sorry. Okay, Adla, you have Thank the you. Let me just share my presentation. It's okay? Um, uh, yes, if you could press F5. Uh, yeah, full screen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I'll, I will present a, a work that we've done together with Petter Osmus, and we're from the University of Stavanger. So, uh, I'm the last speaker, so it's probably good because I, I don't think I will use all my time here, but uh, I will present our uh, current findings in this work. So uh, the basic research question we're looking at is, we're looking at coal imports to the EU, European market, and uh, we, we're looking whether the cheaper coal 
that went into the European market following the, the shale gas boom in the US, if it affected the European electricity prices. So that's the basic uh, research question we're looking at. And the sort of idea behind this is that the shale boom, which we can date to around 2009, when it really started hitting the US market, the prices of natural gas in the US, this, this boom was, was uh, primarily a local domestic effect in the US. In the sense, they didn't, we didn't really notice much in the European natural gas prices due to the shale boom. In that, at least in that first uh, first years of the boom, so the reason being that it, there are restrictions uh, and the constraints on the exports, both regulatory and uh, the infrastructure for exporting was not there. Natural gas in the U.S., so the effect was mostly localized. Uh, but however, the the coal market. Uh, exports were not restricted. So a channel by which the, the shale boom kind of could have affected Europe is through through the coal market is our sort of basic idea. And and we we tried to look at this question using fairly standard uh, time series analysis. We're using a distributed lag model to to model the price formation on the new pool exchange from 2008 to 19 and and we we look at different price drivers in that period and the carbon fuel sources we look at the, the crude oil and uh, the the your uh, nbp natural gas and uh, the us natural gas price and the import price of coal in in europe as price drivers for the electricity no pool and then we also we look at um, some renewables uh, wind and hydro um, where we look at the the quantities there because we don't have prices for these inputs so that's the the basic uh, tool that we look use to look at this uh, research question at least for now so a, a bit of background if you look at the us it's not my aim here to go into the complexities of the us uh, electricity generation but a pattern that is clear in the US is that since around 2009, the, the share of coal here in the energy unit as inputs in the electricity generation has, has gone down with a steady trend, while the use of natural gas in, in domestic US electricity generation has steadily increased. So it's been a clear shift here away from coal and, and more use of natural gas in the US electricity generation which kind of makes sense, uh, I mean, for many reasons, but the, the, the availability of cheap gas in the US being one uh, factor here. And then if we look at coal exports from the US, this is also in the energy units here, it's clear that we, there was a increase in, in, in exports of coal from the US, peaked around 2013 and, uh, a considerable share of the, the U.S. coal that is exported goes to Europe. And there's been an increased coal exports to Europe uh, up to at least 2012, 13, where it kind of peaked, and then it's, the European uh, coal imports uh, from the U.S. has gone has gone down a bit. But there is a there's been an increase in coal exports in that shale boom period following 2009. So if you look a bit at the prices of coal and, and natural gas in both Europe and the EU, it's clear that the, the, the EU natural gas, which is here measured by the UK, uh, it's well known that this, the, the, the European natural gas is uh, closely linked to the, to the crude oil. So following this uh, shale boom in 2009, the, the, the European natural gas is, uh, simply tracked the, the Brent price and increased uh, after the financial crisis. And uh, while the US uh, natural gas, uh, of course, is, has been very cheap, as is uh, well known, but the, the coal prices uh, appear to be much more integrated, uh, the coal prices in the US and uh, EU, than are the natural gas prices. 
So uh, that's a bit of background, and then I will look at uh, our analysis here. We are, we are looking at the new pool electricity price determination. We use weekly average system prices, and we use all the prices are, are measured in the same unit. So we use dollar per megawatt hour as the common price unit. These are weekly prices starting in 2009 and up to 2019. So in the pen variables in this price determination, we use the carbon fuel sources going into electricity production, crude oil, coal, and natural gas. Uh, we don't include any consideration of carbon pricing or anything like that, just a pure factor prices here. And then um, we also look at the, some re renewables uh, production production data then, not prices, because we don't have prices. And we use the distributed lag with the electricity as the dependent variable, yeah. So uh, what I will present us in terms of the findings is, is, a, is this a impulse response analysis where we look at, okay, given there is a increase, for instance, in the crude, crude oil, how does the model say this will affect the electricity price. And we look at each of these independent variables. We shock them independently and we trace out the impact on the electricity price. So the, in the paper, we go through a lot of more detail on the, on the time series properties and all that, but uh, I will refer to the paper for more detail on that and just go straight to the results here. So if you look at crude oil, this, so the impact in this figure here occurs in week 10. There's a one standard deviation increase in the brand price. And then we track the effect on the uh, electricity price and deviations from mean. So the, just this figure just says essentially that the, the crude oil doesn't really affect the, in this period, has much effect on the no pool price. So that's the crude. And then if you look at the natural gas, this is the UK natural gas. We see a, an increase in natural gas in week 10 leads to an increase in the uh, electricity price, but a, a, a sort of short term in, increase and before it reverts back. So there is some impact from the natural gas on the, in this period on the electricity price. And then, uh, we look at the, the hydro, we look at hydro production, and this has a very strong negative impact. It's just reasonable. So an increase in the no pool hydro reserve, which is the unit here in week 10 has a strong negative impact on the price uh, of the electricity, but uh, it's only short lived. I mean, this also kind of makes sense given the reserves are emptied out, the, any increase will be temporary. But it's a strong short-term negative, uh, depressing effect on price of having more hydro reserve. And the wind, I think also makes sense. Uh, we increase uh, wind power generation in week 10 by one standard deviation has a pretty, pretty strong negative long-term effect on the electricity price, which given the technology of wind being a asset that produces continuously, uh, it makes sense that adding more wind will have a permanent effect on price compared to a hydro water reserve. Uh, so uh, the coal, we also find has a strong long-term impact on the electricity price in this period, in the sense that the increase in the coal price will increase electricity price. Uh, and this is not a temporary effect, so it's sort of a trend effect, long-term effect from the coal price, imported coal on the no pool system price. So if we then go to the US uh, natural gas, we haven't considered the US market. 
if you look at the natural gas here, we do find that the U.S. natural gas actually can explain the the EU, the EU imported coal price in the sense that it range of causes the import price for coal. And it also, if you use US natural gas, this also has an effect on the electricity price in Europe, which we, ex, ex, which we can explain by the fact that the, the trend in the coal price that we have observed in, uh, in the EU can be explained by the trend in the US natural gas price. So the intuition is there that we have for this is, is simply that this, these are coal and natural gas in the US are substitutes. So when, when the US natural gas is cheap, they use more of it in electricity generation, freeing up coal for exports, which are cheaper and affecting the EU market through the coal channel. So that's our sort of economic uh, intuition for these results yeah so that's what we have so far and thus to conclude uh, we have seen relatively cheap coal in this period especially in the period following 2009 up to 13 14 that has contributed according to our analysis to cheaper european electricity and the effect, the certain size effect in this period is similar to what we have seen in expanding wind power generation effect on the European electricity. So I think the, the sort of takeaway here is that energy markets are complex. And even though the shale boom didn't really affect European natural gas prices, it could uh, likely have affected European electricity markets through the coal channel, which was not to the same degree restricted in the US as it was in, as the natural gas exports was. So this sort of highlights, and uh, I think the complex connections that we can see in an energy markets through the substitution, such as in an electricity generation and combined with international trade. Yeah, actually then I got through it pretty quickly, but. Okay. Yeah, that's what we have found so far. Okay, thank you, uh, Adler. Are there uh, any questions, uh, comments from uh, the audience? Uh, I, I was wondering one thing because you are, from what I understood, you when you do the analysis, you are focusing on the North Pool uh, market, uh, and I was wondering, if, more broadly speaking, if the same result you would expect for other uh, geographies within Europe, because in North Pool you have lots of hydro, and probably this is the marginal cost, uh, marginal price setter. And I wonder if it will be even more pronounced the effect on, I don't know, some carbon uh, intensive uh, or oh, coal intensive uh, power markets. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good point. Uh, I didn't, of course, as you know, coal has been phased out or not complete, of course, not completely phased out, but more and more phased out in Europe. But I think it's, it's dangerous to look at, as you said, uh, market shares of a input and its effect on price because coal being a relatively uh, declining share will can of course have a price impact by bringing a marginal supplier but um, yeah we have only looked at new pool price and and i think of course it would be interesting to to extend to other electricity mm -hmm. markets and uh, yeah we're looking at that but uh, currently we have only that the North Pole system, yeah. Because in North Pole, there's not much coal, right? Or there is a bit? There is a bit, but uh, yeah, I didn't get the numbers on the shares. So I maybe should have had that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you. But, yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions?
Um, just trying to understand because, well, uh, I was always thinking that the, the, the uh, uh, shale gas boom in the US actually, uh, well, also resulted in quite some export of gas to, uh, to the European Union, which apparently was not the case, uh, if I understand you. Wow. Correct. The, thing with the, the, the reason why this was just a big event in the US is that prior to this boom, the US mostly invested in regasification facilities for importing. And suddenly they, they were sitting on a lot of domestic available gas and they did not have the capacity to, to liquefy gas for exports, except what goes in pipelines. Uh, but for most of it has to be by LNG. Mm -hmm. And they did not have the regulatory and the capacity to export. But this is, of course, this is some years ago now. So they have been exporting uh, in the recent years, five years or so. But of course, it takes time to the regulatory process and investments in building this uh, liquefaction. So in, in that period, when it really hit, say, a five year period, 2009 to 14, there was very little capacity for exporting this US gas that they had mm -hmm. suddenly found themselves to have a lot of yeah and to to what extent can you be sure that the uh, because essentially that is what you're saying i think that the uh, european gold prices they are well being influenced by uh, indirectly uh, through this uh, shale gas boom um, and that, okay, that's an international market also, uh, I agree with that, but to what extent could that uh, the evolution that you observe in, in, uh, in Europe regarding coal prices not be driven by uh, climate policy in Europe, which is much more stricter and which is pushing out coal? Uh, yeah, uh, I think it definitely could. And of course, we it's very difficult to know this. There's a lot of complexity and channels, but it's sort of, I think at least it makes some economic sense that given they're phasing out coal in the US for the shale gas and there are more there were more coal put on the market in that period and given this quite a lot of the coal that comes from the US went to Europe I think it's a reasonable hypothesis that this contribute to making coal cheaper in that period what went into Europe and if if coal has an effect on the European electricity price, which some argue does through it being a marginal supplier, I think it is a reasonable hypothesis that it would have had some price effects. But as I said, there is there's a lot of complexities here and limits to what you can know by doing time series analysis. Yeah. So yeah. so this is one uh, one look at it, I would say, for now. So. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? We have still 10 minutes left, so uh, there's room for uh, a number of other questions. Uh, maybe also uh, questions uh, for the other speakers, I don't know. Maybe uh, if I may, can I ask a question to you, Guido? Uh, I wonder, uh, considering that the uh, session is about emissions, uh, CO2 emissions in the electricity market, I wonder how, where do you see the research uh, field going on in, in this direction? Uh, what kind of topics would be, uh, you think it will be uh, the main ones for the following, I don't know, five, 10 years? I know it's a very generic and broad question, but I'm interested in your opinion on that. Uh, that's a difficult question also for me to answer. Of course, it's not an easy one, and there's no right or wrong answer. It's just opinions. It's just, it's not because I'm sharing this session that I'm, <laughs> I'm really an expert in this. I was only asked last week to do this. So. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I well, there may be others that, uh, that uh, are present in here. Well, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think it's a topic that is growing. We need to understand how we can decarbonize this electricity market. We all seem to tackle it from different perspectives. And to a certain extent, we can do it with renewables. We are expecting, uh, I don't know, storage to help, maybe hydrogen to help. But 
it's mm -hmm. very hard to find one solution that is like the magic one. So. But there, there is maybe one general, uh, well, reflection that I, uh, I made when looking at the, the four abstracts, basically, uh, mm -hmm. it is yesterday as preparation for this session. Um, because we are, well, living in the European Union, so we have the EU ETS scheme. So then my reflection was, okay, to what extent uh, is, well, some of the, the research done in, in the papers that we presented today relevant for the European uh, situation because, well, um, uh, renewable policy uh, initiatives in, in uh, member states essentially will not uh, result in, in, in uh, CO2 emission reductions, uh, mm -hmm. given EU ETS, of course. Yeah? So, um, uh, so that was, well, I would not say a, a critique, but a, a general reflection that I had when looking at the papers. And maybe these, um, that observation is also being tackled in the introduction of the papers itself. But I think it's a very, very relevant point, and uh, I can just add something on it. Uh, it was not directly, at least in my uh, work, uh, tackled, but uh, we, we did something similar, uh, something a bit more similar, but also different with some students uh, in Rotterdam. And then we analyzed what pricing the EU ETS should have, such that, uh, at least in the Netherlands or maybe even in Germany, uh, the coal will not be competitive and it will be outtaken by gas. So, for example, uh, do, by doing this, you would already have a reduction in the CO2 emissions because gas, even if it's polluting, it's less polluting than, than, than coal. And the estimation there was around uh, like 30, 30 euros uh, per uh, ton. And at that point, it was uh, somewhere around 20 something euros. And now it's uh, 50, uh, 55, which is uh, already a much higher level. So I didn't look recently at uh, how the power mix changed, but I would assume that with these high prices, uh, uh, coal uh, power plants have problems. And unless they find ways to, I don't know, get subsidies or something, it can, it is hard to survive on long term with high uh, CO2 uh, prices, or if they manage to install some carbon capturing uh, uh, applications on their uh, power plants, maybe they can survive. But I think it is efficient, it's just until recently it was very low prices, so it, it's just not that, uh, that efficient. Mm -hmm. But it depends, for example, in Australia, when they uh, conducted this carbon pricing mechanism, what we saw was the carbon pass-through rate uh, within, in some states, 150%. So uh, as long as they can pass uh, this cost to consumer, then why should they bother themselves to uh, remove the coal and switch to gas or renewable? You know, it depends on the market. I'm not sure about the euro, but here in Australia, uh, because of the contracts um, between the wholesale market, retailer, and from retailer to consumer, they easily can pass through the cost to consumers. But then the consumer will not move to a cheaper producer? Yeah. At least this wasn't the case uh, when we had this uh, carbon pricing mechanism. Because, I mean, you should take into consideration the short term and the uh, elasticity, yeah? The demand elasticity, so there is no other choice. But renewable energy was more successful because now government pay um, um, about 80% of the cost of solar PV in Australia. Um, and here we have a sunny country. So now solar um, uh, resulted in a, a reduction in emission intensity, but we couldn't uh, estimate that one because it's not in the data because it's not traded yet. It doesn't come to the market. So in the data that I use and the graph that I showed you, we do not have the solar uh, PV uh, role. Another remark that I think Christian was hinting to that too, uh, when we were discussing before. So uh, we know we are in a world which is characterized by increasing penetration of renewables. And uh, we're talking about the benefits, but sometimes actually the costs of the integration of renewables, 
I think they are becoming more and more relevant to to study and to try to find new flexibility measures for transmission system operators to deal with this um, this uh, aspect uh, because I'm curious about how storage technologies can actually mitigate the impact of uh, renewables in the terms that they increase the volatility and uh, so it, it um, poses new efforts for transmission system operators to maintain flexibility and reliability in the grid and also when you are lacking the penetration of renewables uh, um, that uh, you need to have sufficient baseload capacity and uh, you need to maintain a balance which is not which is a complex uh, task to be performed without having too much expenses for the final consumers in terms of grid uh, cost and grid uh, uh, weight actually so the risk of congestions uh, so in Italy for instance it is a very hot topic in fact uh, the reason why we keep on increasing the number of physical market zones is because of congestion essentially and now they are seven uh, for instance I don't know how much zones are in the North Pool uh, market at the moment but anyway uh, it is a very relevant aspect to be taken into account. I don't know what's your opinion about storage and the potential for also in terms of the carbonization, eh? because that is a key aspect as well. Philippe, I think it's very interesting what you just mentioned that well, in Italy it's true that you have these zones and I think is a uh one of the only countries in Europe that has separate their uh, their uh, territory into various uh, locational prices and that's I think it would be interesting to analyze a separation between a country like Italy and let's say I don't know Spain or that uses just one uh, entire uh, market or an entire bidding zone and see if actually helps and I would assume that it helps to have uh, locational prices and to be able to do to, uh, to in this way, you kind of uh, account for the congestion uh, problems that the renewables can have. Like Germany is uh, just one big uh, bidding zone, but you have lots of renewables in the north and lots of industry in the south, and that creates lots of congestion uh, problems. And maybe it would make sense to somehow create more bidding zones. But that kind of contravenes with uh, what EU wants to get one European market. So we have to find a way to integrate more, to uh, connect us more, but also to take into account all the local situation and the potential congestion problems. But yeah, I think there are many, many things that should be still studied on this, uh, on this market. As well, indeed. As well, indeed, well, as well as the role of market manipulation as well, when congestion are uh, occurring mm -hmm. that is also a relevant aspect okay. Good. sorry to interrupt you uh, this seems an interesting discussion but it's 11 o'clock I'm, I'm not sure whether there is uh, another session starting uh, in a minute and I would like to give everybody the opportunity to also uh, uh, go to that other session so um, if it's okay for you, I would like to, to close this uh, conference session. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all four speakers uh, for their presentation, their interesting presentation and the uh, stimulating discussion that we, we had. Um, once again, sorry for uh, beaming, drawing out and, and not always being able to, to keep a uh, track of time. But uh, anyway, uh, once again, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the remainder of uh, this conference. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's Bye. hope to meet in person one day. Yeah. Yeah. We hope so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Bye. Good luck okay. to everyone. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Cheers. You too. Bye-bye.